Jeremiah 23. <laughs> All right, 31, 16, 17. Um, we got some gifts just from the church, uh, from the members and everybody just around us. Uh, in honor of appreciation, pastor appreciation. Uh, we love you guys. Uh, you guys are awesome, and uh, we thank you so much for all your hard work. So on behalf of everybody, uh, here's one for Tim, and you and your wife, and then brother, pastor, That was and, and now Jeremiah is going to pray for oh, us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call him Pastor Jim. Okay. okay. So we're going to pray. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for tonight and this just, just fun atmosphere of, of brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Lord, it's this bond together, Lord, that just makes us such a special time together. And, and Father, we just pray for... Uh, we pray for our pastors. We pray for the men that you, Lord, have risen up, uh, and women, Julie, to, to help us along in this life, to point us towards Jesus Christ. Believing from my, the deepest part of my heart that that's exactly what they do. So, Lord, I pray that you bless them, you encourage them during tough times. And as us, the, the, the congregation, Lord, we pray for opportunity to serve and help them and support them in any way. So, uh, Lord, we ask for your spirit, the Holy Spirit, to come in tonight and just lead our worship, lead the teaching, lead our fellowship and our prayer uh, as we worship the one true God, Jesus Christ. I'm speechless. Uh, thank you for... Um, Blessing and gracing my wife and I um, this evening uh, with your fellowship and your friendship. Um, you know, but let us gear up to fight. That's about all the sentiment you're going to get from me, man. There are people that are going to hell without Jesus Christ. And um, <laughs> let us be fixed and poignant on the things that Christ has called us to do. I do certainly covet and I extend to you just the deepest appreciation for your prayers. It has covered my wife and I. It has protected my wife and I. It has stirred my wife and I. I hope that you guys will continue to pray for the work here, especially the teaching of the work. May God, according to Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, might he open up a door that is worth of giving, giving his word a platform that those that have, would, have, would have an ear, a listening ear to hear, might come to know the truth found in his scriptures about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So may we continue to fight uh, this battle that God has put us in, um, but thank you. Um, it is, um, I love what Pastor David always um, mentions is just the sweetness of this season. It is a gift. And may we, may we um, constantly acknowledge it as such um, and may it stir us to really fight for those who don't know the Lord. So souls his arm has not grown short now as is our practice we are systematically going through the scriptures and this is where i'm most comfortable <laughs> it's just teaching um zechariah chapter three so if you have a bible would you turn there and maybe you can as you're turning there you might take one listening ear to hear those pages turning um a, a, a sound that i would uh, arguably say is one of the most sweetest sounds to hear and that's the sound of Bible pages turning. Now, during worship, I was reflecting on Zechariah. And remember, he has now been commissioned and he has been tasked to address the nation about how the temple, which is in ruins, needs to be rebuilt. And of course, as they would come back to the promised land and now as, as refugees and, and as exiles and they'd be returning, obviously with their eyes, they would see the, the destruction and, and the flood of despair that must invade their heart and, and, and really conclude that the task is overwhelming. It's impossible. How could we begin to be, how could we begin to rebuild? And the interesting thing I was thinking about this is, is Zechariah wasn't the only prophet at the time raised up with that clarion call. 
that you need to go back and do the Lord's work. Haggai was there, and so was Malachi. But Zechariah, as we look at his, his book, his prophecy, we discover some important demographics about him. He was young. He was young. And the reason um, I think I'm drawn to that conclusion is I think of the book of Revelation, and I think of um, the Apostle John, John the Beloved. And at the time that, that the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ was inspired, he was banished to the island of Patmos. And he was an older man. You know, he, he, his, he was a, a, this attempted murder by Caesar by putting him in this boiling A cauldron of oil was unsuccessful. And in his frustration, he banned him to the island of Patmos, where by day he would break rock, and by night he would, see, he would sit and receive this, this prophecy, this inspired word that would come from the Spirit, um, and by visitation by these, by these angels. But he was older. So he would have been mature. He would have been seasoned. He would have, he would have been no stranger to opposition and affliction. This, I mean, he just got boiled alive and survived. He would have been used to the persecution. But here's Zechariah, in contrast, a young guy, perhaps with wobbly knees and given this task to address a remnant of the nation. When Moses would bring them out of Egypt, they were about three million strong. But those that have survived the, the Babylonian captivity are now coming out around 55,000. So it's just a remnant. And yet God would raise up this young man perhaps in his late teens, perhaps in his early 20s, to address the nation about rebuilding. What an awesome task. And yet, for us, we need to, you know, draw that occlusion, you know, that, that God is perfect in his assignment and his appointments. He does use the weak and the foolish. I mean, we marvel at now after two years having begun a work here that God would bring this surfer from California, or as I like to say, Cali, Right? Uh, to assimilate in the Midwest values and culture with the simple task in ministry to teach the Bible line upon line. Right, <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, again, it's just like, I don't want to say the sheer folly of it, but the Lord certainly has a humor. And here he would raise up this young man, Zachariah, to go forward. Now, when we look at chapter one, it does give his, I don't want to say his pedigree, but, it, but his, his, um, who his family is. And it mentions his father, Barakiah, and of course, Barakiah in the scriptures is unknown, so we don't know who he is, but it does also mention the prophet Edo, which we find in the book of Kings, uh, and in Ezra, and Nehemiah, and it's his grandfather. So something about the grandfather's influence, now we have a grandson that's been called into the ministry. And I find that interesting because what I have at home is I have my great, great, great grandfather's Bible, A.P. Johnson. Um, he uh, was a graduate of Andover Seminary, which was the first seminary in the Americas, um, reformed. He was a Calvinist. <laughs> um, but he was commissioned just like me by the Lord. He was ordained a pastor in, nine, in 1866, and he would have spent his ministry here in the Midwest. He would have gone from Illinois to Ohio uh, to even Joplin, Missouri for a season and, and pretty much shepherd in this area. In fact, there was a time when he was not far from D.L. Moody during his ministry. So perhaps they were contemporaries. Or perhaps they were friends. I don't, I don't know the alliance there. But when I look back at the history of my family, I have no other record of, of, of a Christian influence. But there is my great, great, great grandfather, A.P. Johnson. Mm -hmm. And now I have his bio. It's a wreck. It's a hundred and... Well, he was ordained in 1866. I was ordained in 2009. Um, so it's quite some, some time has passed. But again, I can liken it to Zechariah that God would now raise up the young and the old to send forth his message. And again, when we study the scriptures, it needs to be in light of context. We need to know the background and sort of the things that are transpiring with the audience during the time it was penned. And even the inspired vessel that was used, the author, the background author. That's why it's so important. So that way we won't be in the practice of drawing a foul or wrong conclusion. You see, when you take something out of the scriptures, it's called exegesis. In other words, it's a drawing out. But unless you incorporate the context, what you're going to do is called eisegesis, where you're going to put into the scriptures your own mores, your own principles, your own bias, um, that which you want it to say. 
You're going to use it to your own advantage and now out of context. So we always need to draw out what God has intended in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? You look at it contextually. So Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. And we're only going to go through verses 1 through 5 tonight because our application will be found in Matthew 22. But this is what verse 1 says. It says, Then he showed me Joshua. So as I look at the first two chapters, I can deduct that this is the fourth vision and it's the fourth, fourth vision given by what we've called the interpreting angel. And in this fourth vision, he shows Zechariah, Joshua the high priest. Now what we're going to learn is he's going to show us the high priest during the day of atonement. That one day where the high priest would go into the holies of holy to offer up a sacrifice for the atonement first of himself and then of the nation. So again, it's a significant time in that Levitical calendar. And here comes this vision to this young man, Zechariah. But he says that the high priest is standing. And that position is very critical. Because when we look at that stance within the scriptures, we understand that it speaks of ministry. That he is standing to minister to the Lord. Again, service birthed always out of a relationship. But it says there that he's standing before the angel of the Lord. Now what we're going to see here in chapter 3 is this picture of a celestial or heaven, heavenly courtroom. It's going to be like the scene of a courtroom. And we're going to see here that the angel of the Lord is, is in a position of judge. But look who else is there in the courtroom. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. So here we see that Satan, the adversary, he's opposing Zachariah. Well, actually he's opposing Joshua the high priest. And that word um, right hand speaks again this position of accusation under the law. But what we need to glean first here is that our adversary is not human. He's angelic. He's talking here about Satan, the fallen angel. But he says he stands there to oppose the sinner. In other words, he acts as an impeding force between the sinner and his access to God. Again, we're going to find throughout the scriptures that Satan stands in the attack but he's portrayed as a prosecutor. Again, to accuse Joshua. Now the word here is diabolos, uh, which is probably where we get our English word diabolical. Um, but he's an informer. And Jewish tradition believes that he's employed by God to bring back all this unfavorable um, uh, report to Lord about the nation. Of course, we sort of find that um, being built up in Job chapter 1 verse 2. As you see, this another courtroom setting, and, and here comes the Son of Men coming in and out, and then Satan accompanies him. And the Lord addresses him, hey man, where you been? He's like, ah, you know, searching to and fro, walking the earth, back and forth. And at this point, dialogue begins to ensue, and he says, well, hey, while you're out there looking for people to accuse, have you considered my servant Job? And of course, the story would unfold through the book of Job. But what we see here is a picture is that Satan acts as an informer to accuse mankind to the Lord. Now, when it comes to Satan, just real quick, I got a bunch of notes on him. and I really don't want to spend a lot of time on him, but I want to give you some idea about him. Again, uh, Satan, we need to understand, was a high ranking angel. He was a perfect archangel. He was the perfect messenger. He was created by God with the free will who was tasked as a servant to lead the heavenly host into worship of God. In essence, we could say he acted like a choir director. Now, the interesting thing about that word worship, I heard a new definition uh, for the term worship today as I was reading uh, through this book by a man. I think his name is William Keller. Uh, he's the same author who wrote um, A Layman's Look at Psalms 23. I can't remember his first name, but his last name is Keller. But he said worship is, is, a, is a person who not only communes with God, but enjoys his company. That's what worship is. It's just enjoying the company of the Father. That's all worship is. So if you see someone in the stance and, and in the charade of worship and yet does not enjoy the company of the Lord or the Father, it's not real worship. In fact, right now what we need to do is begin to examine our own heart. Do we enjoy the company of a Father? Simple question, Amen. right? But here we see that that was supposed to be Satan's intended pur um, <clears throat> purpose was to usher the other angels into the presence to worship God. Again, teaching the other angels about communion and the enjoyment of the Father's company. Excuse me. But because of his pride, and again, pride is sin. 
It's not a character defect. It's not a shortcoming. It's not just the way, you know, his bent. No, it is sin. Okay? And, I, and we, we kind of chuckle because we have a tendency to gloss over the truth. Oh, it was a mistake. It was an error. I stumbled. Nah, brother, you in sin. Right? It's sin. He rebelled against God and he was cast out of heaven and he took a third of the angels with him. Again, here we see this mass and this forced deception. And these fallen angels today are called demons. Now, Satan um, has many names such as Lucifer, which means light bearer, and the destroyer. His character is one of hate, evil, and deception, which is epitomized by his lying tongue. Satan knows his time is short, therefore his attacks on the church, whether from the outside or from within, are relentless, fierce, and deadly. Satan is not a god. And he is not the brother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Satan is not the equal of Jesus Christ. Now, I know we, we kind of chuckle because this is a foundation. It's biblical. And yet there are those who have moved away from the scriptures and have developed him into being something else. But he is not the equal of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, Satan is real and he is your enemy. He's your enemy. And again, he is who we see now in that celestial and heavenly courtroom. He's the one who's come to accuse and to oppose Joshua, the high priest. So now we're kind of getting an understanding of who's taking place here in the court. Now, Satan, we know, was thrown out of heaven. We find that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. But it's captured well in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7, 9, and 17. Um, and you can read that um, on your own. But back to Zechariah. And it says there in verse 2, And the Lord said to Satan, and here we see the Lord addressing Satan directly. He says, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Again, here we see it being uh, repeated for emphasis. Mm -hmm. But ultimately what we can glean from this is that Satan's accusation against man is ineffective when it comes before the <clears throat> Lord. What else is cool too is here we see this practice being established for us. It's not me who rebukes Satan, but it is the Lord thy God who rebukes Satan. Again, we see that in the book of Jude. There's only one chapter, so chapter 1, verse 9, where Michael the archangel, when he was contending with Satan over the body of Moses, which we do not know where it is. And as Satan was coming to accuse Moses and probably just to cause, you know, angelic conflict between Michael, Michael would then respond to him and say, the Lord rebuke you. Not me, Michael the archangel, which is crazy about Michael because when we look through the, uh, the book of Revelation and, it, and we see prophecy and eschatology, which is things to come, we see there will come a day when Michael will whoop his butt. Mm. Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're in the Midwest, right? We wear boots. We talk like that. <laughs> right? Where, where he will just whoop his bottom. So it's not a matter of, of, of being less than Satan. But he understood where the true power source was. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, not his own might being in might as an archangel. He said the Lord. He said the Lord rebuke you. And again, that is teaching us where does our strength lie in? In the Lord. In Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. And it says there, the Lord rebuke you. <clears throat> but then he continues, and I love this. He says, is this not a brand plucked from the fire again here this brand most likely is a picture of Jerusalem which has now been delivered and is going to function as a tool of judgment but it can also mean Joshua um, who would represent um, Jerusalem and the, and the people and all the people but what I, when I look at that word brand I think of something that is youthful, useful and is something that we would use to stamp the identity onto a beast but it only uses the term brand in the New King James Version. But in the King James Version, it calls it a stick. It calls it a stick. And what I thought was neat about the stick is the stick is very weak, but it is very loved. And here we see that this stick that has now been burned is pulled out of the fire and it is protected and it has been saved. So there's this dual image within the stick that's now been taken out of the fire. 
But the fire here should act as a picture of the Babylonian captivity. Again, one more time, it suggests oppression. But the fire here too can also act as a purifying agent. But why is the stick retrieved? Because what we're going to learn is that God has created us with purpose. Now in Exodus 9 verse 16, a verse I just heard Sunday night, that God says about the nation of Israel, he says, I created you so that I might demonstrate my power against those who come against you. Again, this is during the time of Exodus. God says, I'm going to raise you up. Not because you're great or you're mighty, but because I love you. And I'm going to use you to reflect my power against those pagans, the Egyptians, who have rejected my namesake. So here we see this purpose that he created the nation of Israel in part to show his power. Now for us as the church, we discover in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 why we have been created. Again, the church is not the nation of Israel. We are distinct and separate entities. We find that clearly taught throughout the scriptures. But look what we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I love this. And this is Paul speaking to the church there in Ephesus. He says, for we are his. Again, it's possessional. There is an owner of our lives. And it's funny today because... Um, <clears throat> You know, I know the world celebrates the last day of October and they call it something and they make it really scary. Um, but we don't, you know, and, and part of the reason we don't is because I am no longer my own, but I'm now rightfully owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm his. I'm his. I have now been set apart and sanctified for his pleasure and his purpose. I'm his. And therefore my purpose is for him. And here we see that that purpose is identified as being his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus. Again, I think this is an image uh, drawn through Jeremiah as the potter. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were created with the purpose. Now, as some of you might know, that word workman there is actually poema. It's where we get our English translation poem. So here we see that we're not, you know, and again, when you see that word a workman, you think of a, of a master craftsman, which Jesus is like in a craftsman as well, and he's in his wood shop, you know, and he's got all these tools and the saws going and all this dust is flying everywhere. But that's actually not what Paul is saying. He's sitting here and he's liking God to a poet. And he says he has this beautiful message that's not been written on, on letters or epistles of stone, but one that's been written on a heart. We are his poem. We are his poem. You're a poem. You're a poem. You're God's poem. So if anyone else comes and says something contrary to that, they are a liar and a false prophet. You are the poem of the living God. A poem. Yeah. So what do I say? You know? Well, hopefully the poem I think here is so that we might reflect the gospel and the way of salvation, which is found in Jesus Christ. So here we see that this brand or the stick has been plucked from the fire, but with purpose so that we might do the good works that we have been called to do, which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So here we discover that uh, Zechariah is going to be laying out some heavy things in this chapter. Verse three, Zechariah chapter three, verse three. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing <coughs> excuse me, before the angel. So here it looks like he's sort of awaiting the judge's verdict, whether a sentencing or an execution. But what we learn about his filthy garment here is that that word defiled speaks of sin. And, it's probably, and that sin is probably whatever Satan has accused him of, whatever wrong that is. We know that this garment is contaminated possibly from the, uh, from the battle or because it's just been taken out of the fire. But what else we can glean from this is that when someone stood on trial, it was traditional for the person on trial to wear a garment that was worn out. Again, this would have identified them as being an inmate. I don't know about here, but I know back in California, if you're locked up in the county jail, you wear orange. You have on a garment, right? <laughs> Right? The guards are green. They're called pickles. And the inmates are orange. They're dressed in orange. And here we would see that the filthy garment that Joshua is wearing, the inmate's garment, 
But ultimately what it is, is it's a strong expression. It speaks of vileness and it is loathed. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him. So now we see uh, in there in verse 4 that he, being the angel of the Lord, is now speaking. And he spoke to those who stood before him. Again, here you can liken this as to bailiffs if you want to continue in that celestial courtroom image. But I think it can also be a picture of the cupbearer. In other words, those who were in position of honor and they stood before the king. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. So was Daniel. So they would have been privy to all the intimate dealings within the king's private chamber. And here we see now the high priest is coming because he's been accused. And those men who are privy to all the intimate and delicate and very sensitive matters that the king would deal with, they are now watching. And now the king, and I have to imagine, and I glean this from Nehemiah, but there was a special relationship between the king and Nehemiah. They were close. Now, most likely, if we sort of, you know, follow the, the history in the Old Testament, we could probably say that Nehemiah was the cupbearer for Artaxerxes, I think, for about 15 or so years. So they were very close. A cupbearer would have been likened to like a bodyguard. You remember the movie Bodyguard with Kevin Costner? Whitney, they were close. Probably <laughs> similar. Anyways. And here they stood in this position of honor, and this is what he says. He says, take away the filthy garment from him, and to him he said, so now he's addressing Joshua the high priest. The high priest. He says, see, I have. So here we're, the, the prophet is indicating the work that is done by the Lord alone. See, I have removed your iniquity from you. In other words, I have found you innocent, you have been exonerated, and it is I who will purge you from your sin. It is the Lord who cleanses a man from his sin. And of course, the detergent, the agent, is his blood. We can never get clean to come to the Lord. He must meet us in the midst of our sin, and then he is the one who washes us. He washes us as white as snow, Isaiah 53. And a lot of time we hear that when we're trying to lead people to the truth. They're like, oh, let me just get my life in order, then I'll show up to church. <laughs> That's not how it works. In fact, I read it today on, on Facebook. Someone was saying that they were... You know, they were really like a volcano. They were erupting all these, these excuses because, like, man, once I get things in order, I'll, I'll, I'll come to your Bible study. And it's like, no, 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 no. It is he who removes the iniquity from you. And after he does that, he says, I will clothe you with a rich robe. Now, we find throughout the scriptures that anytime someone is found naked, they are exposed, they are ashamed, and they are uncovered. But what's neat about this is what's taking place is as he takes our filthy garments and we now get clean ones, we're going to be clothed in rich robes. It's actually an exchange that's taking place. He takes your vileness and he puts it upon himself. And in return, he takes off now his cloak, which is a robe of righteousness, and he robes it over you. We find this in Luke chapter 15, verse 22, where we see the prodigal son now having returned to the father and he takes off his own garment right yeah. and he capes it over his son mm -hmm. and it's funny because his son at this point is prostrate he's humiliated he's ashamed he's repenting father i can't believe i've dishonored you like i have and he's there and prostrate he's got his face in the ground and he takes his robe up and he capes him over he gives him his signet ring i think he even gives him his sandals right and he yells back to the house hey my boy's back mm -hmm. slay the fatted calf mm -hmm. So for us, we need to understand it's an exchange that takes place. Your unrighteousness is now cloaked onto Jesus. It's called imputation, the doctrine of imputation. It's now taken from you. It's laid upon him, and his righteousness has now been imputed onto you. It is an exchange. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we, the fallen sinner, might become the righteousness of God. Now we got this new garment. Verse 5, and I said, let them put a clean turban on my head. Now, the interesting thing about the turban is it speaks of this proper covering. But when our head is covered, biblically, we know we are accepted and we have found God's approval. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we have been received and now we are reunited or reconciled with the God whom we had rejected. In other words, as we are accepted and approved, we're no longer separated. We're now united. We're now brought into fellowship with God. 
Again, one more time, that commune and enjoying the company of God. That's all that it means. This is what we discover. And he says, so they put a clean turban on his head and they put clothes on him. Again, here we see the total coverage of our forgiveness. We got robes, we've got clothes, and now we got a, a turban. There's nothing, there's no sin in our life that we have not been exonerated of or cleansed of. There's no dirtiness left in us. We've been completely cleansed. Ah. And the angel of the Lord stood by. So here we see the angel, he's observing, but I would trust he's certifying or he's approving the reinstatement of Joshua, the high priest. We need to pray, but I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 22. Again, um, we discover that garments and clothes, whether symbolic or literal, they're covered throughout the scriptures. And we're going to conclude in Matthew 22. What we're going to look at is the parable of the wedding feast. Matthew is right before Mark, and it's right after Malachi. Thank you. Yeah. I'm always going to do that. Even 20 years from now, I'll be like, all right, because there's always going to be new people coming. There are always going to be new people coming. And as we're maturing and we're growing, we're going to continue to reach out. And we're always going to have a young body coming in that we might teach, that they might mature, that they might be discipled and send out. There's always going to be newbies coming in. Always. So I hope you have an appetite for the fundamentals. Parable of the wedding feast. Verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them. Again, by parables and said, again, that answered, I have to believe that there were these inquiries or these questions were coming in. But how he answers is through a parable. Now, what is a parable? Well, a parable is simply a story that's given, but it has a spiritual principle or conclusion within it. So it's a story, but its conclusion is one of a spiritual matter. That's all a parable is. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. He arranged this marriage, an arranged marriage for the groom. And he sent out his servants to call to those who were invited to the wedding, but, or and, they were not willing to come. Now the interesting thing there about the Jewish culture is that a wedding invite typically comes in two pieces. There's the initial notice that is sent months before. In fact, I'm getting ready to officiate a wedding uh, next month in December. And what they did was they sent out these really cool fridge magnets. And it says, you know, basically, remember this date. So they've notified me well in advance, especially as the pastor officiating the event. <laughs> all right. So it's on the fridge. I, I, you know, I, I look at, at Alex and Allie every day when I'm here. All right. All right. But that's the initial invitation. There will also come one the day before the event. Now, when the initial invitation comes out, in, in, in essence, what we have to sort of glean is that those whom have received the invitation and said, yes, I will attend. I am RSVPing. Expect to see me there. But then they always send. Again, this is part of probably the Jewish culture. And I think, um, again, probably an element of their hospitality. But they send one more notice the day prior to the event. So it's a two invitation coming out. And it says there, it says, and they were not willing to come. In other words, they would not come. And again, he sent out other servants saying, now again, remember, these are people who initially would have agreed to be at this festive occasion, but now the day before they said they were not willing to come. All of a sudden something comes up. And doesn't that happen? <clears throat> you know, you make plans with somebody down the road and you pencil on your calendar and as that as that day you know comes and, and you call them here you come and, and they come up with some measly excuse that's sort of what we're going to see take place here it says and again he sent out other servants saying and what i like about this is we see the tenacious long sufferingness of the king he's long suffering so he sends out other servants and he says tell those who are invited see i have prepared my dinner my ox and my fatted uh, cattle are killed and all things are ready come to the wedding in essence let us celebrate for the son and the church are going to be united again from verse 4 here we know it's a picture of the supper of the lamb in revelation 19 verse 5 but they made light of it and they went their way one to his own farm and another to his business Again, here we would see that those who committed to come would now make light of the final invitation. 
they would minimize or they would they would deem this event to be unimportant and have no value. The king was unimportant and so was the wedding. And the rest seized his servants and they treated them spitefully and they killed them. So now as he's going out to, hey, the event's taking place, not only were some not willing to come, there were others who basically would spit in his face and say, man, you're not worthy of my presence. And then there were those who would actually kill the messengers. Mm. Again, you see the, the hatred there. But when the king heard about it, and again, here's this picture of Jesus' omniscience. He was furious. And the word there, furious, speaks of this wrathful violence. And he sent out his armies, destroying those murderers, and he burned up the city. And that word destroyed there speaks of an eternal damnation. And then he said to his servants, he says, the wedding is ready. In other words, the timing is now. But those who were invited were not worthy. In other words, the king would now set out a scale. And he'd put those who were invited on one end and he'd put something that, were, that was a value on the other end, which we have to trust that within this parable, he's talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. And as they would have rejected the blood and the gift of salvation found on the cross, they would not have been found worthy. So their demerit comes from their rejection of the invitation. Because we know throughout the scriptures, there's none worthy, no, not one. But what we see here, what makes a man unworthy in the eyes of God is when they blaspheme in the Holy Spirit and they reject the gift of salvation found in Jesus Christ. And that's what we see here. And it says there, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all those they found, both good and bad. Again, here we would see that both the good and the bad had accepted the invitation. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came, and imagine the king coming into this ballroom now being filled with guests, the excitement that must have been on him. His son, after all, is getting married. Imagine the delight that must be in the Father's heart now, knowing that our wedding date is coming up, and it is very soon. Mm, it is very soon. Now, me being the father of three daughters, I mean, I guess I'll have to take a, a page from Pastor David. I ain't ready to see daughters get married. But here's the father knowing his son is getting ready to have the bride that he loves and longs for. <laughs> and the king came in to see the guests, and then he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Again, that righteous robe or that rich robe that we find in Zechariah chapter 3. So he said to him, now the king is addressing the, the man with the, without the garment. And he says, friend. Now the word there isn't necessarily the flail that we know is a friendship, but it speaks of a companion. In other words, it was a term of kindness. He says, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he being the man was speechless. In other words, he was muzzled. He was reduced to silence. In other words, the unregenerate will have no defense or no defender. Again, the word there is used by Peter to speak of a fool, one who is ignorant, an ignoranus. It's the same word where we get agnostic from. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him out and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, what is the context of that very controversial verse? The call there speaks of all being invited. The invitation to know salvation through Jesus Christ is for all. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And the world there speaks of the cosmos. It means all of mankind, past tense, present tense, and those that would come to live on this earth. All men have been invited. You see, the cross is very inclusive. It is meant for all. But it says there, but few are chosen. The, the interpretation there is, but few actually respond or accept the invitation. That salvation is found through Jesus Christ alone. Again, and we need to understand this as we get ready to pray, that we need to pray for those that God has spoken to. That they would come to understand that God will cleanse them of that filthy garment. That he will take it from them and he will robe them in richness, in his righteousness. And that they will come to know that heavenly exchange. 
and that they too can be accepted and now found approved before a righteous and just God. And that even though there's an accuser and he's mightier than we are, we have one who stands before us. We have an advocate and he will rebuke the accuser. So again, it's a time to rejoice, but it's also a time to get serious. Let me pray and we'll finish up this chapter next week. I, I probably went a little over, but that's okay. We're eating a lot tonight. Let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. And, um, and your word is, is so deep. And it's, it's so rich and there's so much to learn. And yet, Lord, we delight knowing that you stand between us and the one who accuses us. That when the enemy comes to oppose us, it is you who rebukes him. It is the name of Christ. Lord, I thank you for the righteousness that you have given us. It's something that we do not deserve and we cannot earn. But how I pray, Lord, that we will always be soft and sensitive to accept that invitation to daily walk with you that that would be our practice and our manner. That would be the way we live. Lord, that you would build in us a desire for fellowship with the Father, that we'd be sensitive to your spirit and we'd be found obedient like we learned in John 15. Lord, the only way to prove our love for you is to obey your commands. We need your help. We are the branches and you are the vine. God, just solidify and, and secure that attachment that you might keep us and seal us by your Holy Spirit and that we would be willing, God, to remain. So we love you, Lord. I thank you for tonight. Um, again, how thoughtful you are, that you are so attentive and that you care, that you have forgiven us, Lord, that you love us, that you cover us, that you accept us, Lord, that you stand before us and you protect us. Truly, Lord, it is overwhelming. So we love you, Lord. Would you just bless the time of prayer, short or long, but would you inspire our prayers, Lord, that we would pray according to your will, Lord, and we would see tonight strongholds torn down. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, that was as long as a Sunday.